welcome everyone who's arriving. Uh, we'll just give it about a minute so that I let people come into the session. So. You feel free to say hi to me in the chat if you'd like to. Hi Natalie, another Natalie. I've got people dialing in from all over the country, lots of different services. It's great Good to see. And lots of different job roles as well. Got a real mixture of people. Hopefully everyone will be able to take something away from today, no matter what your service or what your job role is. A few people joining us. There's quite a lot signed up this day. Always a good sign. Okay, so let's make a start. I think we've got, got a majority of us in. Um, obviously, people might continue to join us, but I'll, um, I'll make a start. So welcome, everybody, to this session. Um, this session is about psychologically informed environments. Um, so this is a really big topic. And normally, if, if I was doing a training that was covering all the aspects of what a psychologically informed environment is, I'd be using a, a full day. So for the purpose of today, we're looking uh, from theory to practice. So it's much less about sort of all the, the nuances of the model and much more about some specific examples of where it has worked in practice. Um, and then just a selection of practical tips for, for you in your services. So if you're trying to implement PI, you're trying to be more PI, uh, what can you actually do in your services? Um, my name is Dr. Natalie Isaiah. I'm a clinical psychologist. And clinically, uh, my specialities are trauma and complex trauma. So I've got lots of experience treating um, clients who have experienced PTSD, um, including refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and this kind of the social justice side of things, the working with marginalised clients really drew me into the homelessness sector because I realised actually there's there's a lot of trauma in the homelessness sector, um, and it 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 brings together all my uh, clinical interests. So about four years ago, I started working in the homelessness sector. Um, I spent three and a half years working in house in one of the large homeless hostels in central London. And in the first half of today, I'm going to tell you a bit about that because that's the case study that um, I'm using 
to exemplify where Pi uh, can work in practice. And that was something I was part of. Um, and then last year I moved on from that service. And primarily at the moment I'm working for BGPS, who uh, some of you may be aware of already, Brett Grillier Psychology Services. So I'm an associate with the company. And I'm primarily now working with staff. So I've moved back actually off the front line. Um, and I spend most of my week supporting staff teams by facilitating reflective practice sessions um, and also delivering trainings. Uh, so to similar topics to this. So sort of upskilling, empowering, and supporting the staff who are supporting um, individuals within the homelessness sector. So the outline of the session today, I'm going to do a little brief reminder of what is a psychologically informed environment. Um, some people may have lots of knowledge of this already, other people might not be familiar with the model, so this is it's a brief introduction. Um, and at the end I've got some resource slides and links, so if you're curious to read more um, and learn in more depth about what PI is, um, there's lots of uh, different resources that you can utilise after the session. As I said, I'm also going to talk through a case study of where um, I was helping to implement PI uh, in, a, in a large homeless hostel in central London. Um, then we're going to have a break. Depending on how long it takes me to get through those slides, we might have time for a like Q&A part one before the comfort break, but we'll see how we do the time. And then in the second half, as I said, I'm going to go through some really practical tips about how you can implement PI in your service um, in small ways. And then I've left quite a good chunk of time, I think, at the end. Uh, we should have at least 15 minutes for a final Q&A. So there's not a huge amount of interaction in, in the middle bits, I'm afraid, because uh, we're in a webinar format, but I'm hoping that we'll get loads of really good questions. So throughout the, um, throughout the session, please do use the Q&A box to write your questions. Um, I won't necessarily be monitoring the chat. So if you're asking questions in the chat, we, we may miss them. So try to use the Q&A. You can I think, vote questions up in the Q&A. So if someone else has asked a question that you're interested in, I think you can like it or do something to show that you're interested in that question as well. And then when we come to the Q&A section, um, we can prioritize those questions that there's been a lot of interest in. Um, and that will be the more interactive part. So I'm hoping we get some good questions and we can get a good sort of semi-discussion going. So. So let's start off by having an overview of what a psychologically informed environment is. So the definition I usually use for this is a PI is any service that takes into account psychological needs of its staff and the individuals it's supporting. So one of the myths of PI is it's all about the, the individuals that are using our services, but it's very much about staff as well. And, and we'll see that as we go through the next few slides and look at the different the sections of PI. It's about the whole service. <coughs> Excuse me, apologies in advance, my voice is failing me slightly today. But I'll, we'll do our best. Um, so whether it's, a, whether it's an accommodation-based service, whether it's a floating support service, it could be, um, you know, it could be a police station that could be a psychologically informed environment. It could literally be any service at all. But the hallmark is if I come into your service and I ask you why you're doing something in a certain way, or you know, why is this done this way, or how come the service works like this, the answer I'm going to get from any staff will be couched in terms of sort of psychology. So it will be, you know, to do with people's thoughts, feelings, histories, traumas that they've been through um, and how our processes take those into account as opposed to, oh, well, we do this because my manager told me to or we do this because that's just the policy. So kind of moving away from the bureaucracy and towards kind of being really thoughtful about taking into account those psychological needs. So for that reason, awareness of basic psychological concepts is really important to, to be a PI. Um, so some of the key ones that I would always include in the PI trainings that we deliver um, is a, just a basic knowledge of what trauma is. So the impacts that trauma has upon us, 
um, I talk a lot about the physiology of trauma. So trauma is very much embodied and how does that impact people's behavior day to day? So one of the um, metaphors that I really like to use when we're thinking about being trauma informed or being psychologically informed is an iceberg. Some of you might have heard of an anger iceberg, but the idea being that actually the, the behavior we see on the surface is just the tip of the iceberg. So if somebody's shouting at you and you're seeing anger, being psychologically informed is about stepping back from that interaction and looking below because beneath the surface, it might be that that anger is actually a PTSD symptom because PTSD leads to this chronic hyper arousal, your fight and flight system, your threat system dials up pretty high. So actually, if you've knocked on somebody's door to do a room check and started them, they might shout at you because actually they're startled they're scared and that might in itself be a PTSD symptom so immediately we're understanding that there's more to this than just the person being rude difficult um, again anger is often a stronger more uh, sort of protective emotion that covers up fear that covers up vulnerability so understanding what trauma is and how it impacts on us physiologically and behaviorally is really important ACEs I'm going to talk about in a minute, I've got a whole slide on that, just this um, adverse childhood experiences. So again, very much overlapping with the idea of trauma uh, and complex trauma, so kind of long-term trauma. Attachment theory is one of the models that I feel is key. Um, I use this model every day to, to scaffold my thinking in my personal and professional life, actually. Um, and I always give over a decent amount of time um, when doing PI training to thinking about attachment theory because if staff can understand what might be beneath the behavioral interactions that are going on um, at the very least it helps staff teams to stay connected to their empathy and their understanding and that can help people uh, not to feel so stuck so for example um, you might be working with clients who are showing behaviors that might be perceived as being let's say attention seeking, um, other kind of words people use sometimes when they're describing behavior as like, you know, a bit clingy, a bit attention seeking. Sometimes we get the opposite of that. So we talk about in quotes, non-engagement. You know, my, this client isn't engaging, we should discharge them if it was an NHS service. If they haven't turned up to two sessions, they're being discharged now because they're not engaged. Um, but actually, as soon as you understand that these interpersonal behaviors that we, we develop, very unconsciously in our early years, are protective, they're survival strategies. There's a psychologist called Gabal Masse, who I love, who some of you may be familiar with. Um, and he uses this wonderful analogy of somebody who's grown up in freezing Alaska, and they've got this really, really heavy coat that they're basically sewn into, they can't take it off. And this coat has saved their life. For, for the first like you know part of their life they needed this coat to survive and then all of a sudden they're transported to the Caribbean and it's really hot so they no longer need the coat but they can't take it off the coat has been protective and now it's making them uncomfortable and it's making them really hot and it's no longer needed in the environment but it's just on them they can't easily take that off and that's a nice way to think about these attachment behaviors that we've that we form so whether you've learned that actually you know you need to escalate your distress in order to get your needs met um, you might even learn that you need to manipulate people around you to get your needs met you might feel as if you have to kind of always seek reassurance just to be sure that that person's not going to leave you um, or the opposite where you're so used to being self-sufficient that actually, although you want support, receiving that support and engaging with it becomes terrifying. So you sort of, you say you want it, but then actually when it comes to actually receiving it, you think, oh no, this is too risky. This person's gonna let me down. Um, I'll just I'll just get on with it myself. So again, this, this non-engagement is what we'll see from the other side. So thinking through attachment theory and thinking about how that plays out, in the interpersonal reactions with the people that we're supporting is often very enlightening for staff members. And they, they suddenly go, oh, that's why my clients do that. I get it now. And um, in their day-to-day -day work, that helps people, as I said, stay more connected to their empathy. So in terms of psychological models that you might want to use in your services, there's no one correct model. 
So some services um, might use very uh, specific models like mentalization based treatment, MBT, um, that's used in some of the pies in, in London in some of the hostels. <clears throat> other model, uh, other psych services might use a CBT framework. Um, or the, the place that I was working in, we didn't use a, a particular model in terms of tools, but we very much thought about attachment theory um, and how people's trauma was Im impacting on their current behavior. So there's not a correct model that you need to use. You can draw on lots of different ones as long as you're consistent. So if, if you are a service who likes to draw from sort of CBT tools, then that's great. Just be consistent with that so that everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet. One question I get asked often is what's the difference between a psychologically informed environment and trauma-informed care? And I would say there's a huge amount of overlap, but PIEs are inherently trauma-informed. You, you can't be psychologically informed unless you're trauma-informed for, for the reason that I've, I've just explained. And also because we understand that the whole reason that we're you know, here today uh, and the reason that we use this, these approaches is because actually the vast majority of individuals using our services have experienced complex trauma. So when we're talking about complex trauma, it's not just, um, you know, I had a car accident as an adult, it's I've experienced trauma for many years, usually interpersonally. So whether that be abuse or neglect, um, <clears throat> even bullying to, to a point. So this long-term sort of compounding of relational trauma where your emotional, psychological needs in your developmental years haven't been met um, and, and therefore, you know, the, the development that you've been through, um, you might have missed developmental stages, our brains actually develop slightly differently if we've been through a lot of trauma um, in our younger years. So again, understanding the impact of trauma is, is part of, of a PI. Um, but PI itself, as we'll see from today, goes beyond that as well. So we need to be trauma informed and then there's other things involved in being a PI. Um, a PI is in the atmosphere. <laughs> People um, you know, want to know what to do to be psychologically informed. And as I will do today, I'll give you lots of practical tips, but actually there's so much of being a psychologically informed environment that's intangible. That you can't quite put your finger on. It's about the feeling you get when you walk into the service. It's about how the staff feel about their work. It's about the atmosphere in the team. It's about how the individuals using the services feel about the service that, that they're getting. So it's in the air as much as it is in sort of practical procedures and it's never done. So you never hit a point where you go, right, yeah, we've, pin we've pinnacled, we've done, we've done it, we don't have to do any more now for the party. Um, you, you always have to keep evolving it, thinking about it. And again, in the second half of, of today, I'm gonna to talk about reflection and why you have to continue it's a continual process you can never stop doing that um so unfortunately sometimes you do still get services where they say yes we're pie because we have a practice. practice or yes we're pie because we sent our staff on one training about trauma um or even we're pie because we've got a psychologist in-house um but that doesn't make you pie it's in every moment every interaction every reflection every meeting it's something that has to pervade everything that you do as a service. And because of that, actually, if you really want your service to really embody this model, buy-in from the top is absolutely essential. So you can still work in psychologically informed ways on the front line, even if you're not getting supported from above, but it will be much, much harder to actually make that land. So if there's anyone here who's kind of higher up in an organization and then has that power, then your buy-in and what you do about it is the thing that's gonna make, make or break whether a service manages to, to really sort of get to a good, good level um, of working in a psychologically. So briefly, I just wanted to um, talk about ACEs, uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences, and really, just in case there's, there's people here today who aren't aware of that link between trauma, trauma and homelessness, this is a study that I think just highlights that link fantastically. So 
back in the olden days, um, we, when we didn't realise that homelessness was linked to trauma, there was lots of narratives around, you know, homeless choice, homelessness is about not having a home, um, and addictions as well around, you know, well, addictions are a choice and people should just stop using their drugs and get a job. Um, and actually the ACEs research uh, was a piece of research. It was done in America with a huge um, cohort uh, of people. It was a questionnaire based study. 17,000 people, I think, were involved in the original study. Um, so, the, you know, the caveat of this is many of this research is this kind of white Western research, it's correlational. So there are criticisms that come along with the study. But that said, it has been, then been replicated a lot in lots of different cultures. And broadly, these statistical links um, are the same where we're replicating these findings again and again. So it's pretty sturdy research. So the reason this was so important is because it drew um, links between the number of traumas or adverse childhood experiences that a person has experienced in their early life. So things like abuse, neglect, witnessing domestic violence, growing up with adults in the household who are using substances, struggling with severe mental illness, um, or kind of in and out of the criminal justice system. So the, the more of those you have, the more likely you are to experience certain outcomes in adulthood. Now I'll say again, this is a correlation. So it's about likelihood. It doesn't mean that if you've experienced those things, you will definitely experience the outcomes. Um, but the outcomes include um, increased likelihood of substance misuse, increased um, likelihood of co contact with uh, the criminal justice system, homelessness, as this graphic shows, um, mental health problems, and crucially as well, physical health problems. So what was really important about this piece of research was that it was the first study that showed a link between these emotional psychological traumas and physical health problems like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, that people didn't really think were connected. The reason that these connections exist is because of toxic stress. So if a child is constantly in an environment where they're scared, where their fight and flight system is switched on, that cortisol is sort of chronically in their body and that erodes your immune system. It makes you more likely to get sick um, and potentially puts you at higher risk of physical health problems when you're older. But then also it impacts on your psychological development, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. So rather than growing up with, you know, a really positive sense of self and learning that you can go to other people for support and that you can manage your own emotions and calm yourself down when you're upset, you, you miss out on those positive experiences. So you start, you, you might become a teenager feeling all these very, very intense, difficult emotions. And you, you haven't had a chance to develop the internal social resources that you need to cope with that. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna start using substances because substances are an incredibly effective way to manage your emotion in the absence of any other um, resources. Obviously, I'm not saying that they're a, they're a good way to do it, but they're undoubtedly an effective way to do it. Start using substances when you're 12, probably going to drop out of school you're probably going to uh, be more likely to get involved in crime so all of these things compound on each other so they're certainly not it's not that you'll these things will definitely happen this this research is about likelihood and zooming out from this what we see when we look at our sector is that the the issues that people are struggling with here so the, the clients that we're working with have multiple physical health problems they come in with lists of mental health problems they have you know severe and chronic substance misuse um, they're in and out of the criminal justice system they're homeless and unfortunately our system is still segregating these things so people getting bounced between the substance misuse service the mental health service the gp as if these things are separate but what we need to start understanding to be working in a really psychologically informed and trauma-informed way is these things all come under one umbrella of complex trauma. They, they do all need to be addressed, but sort of in an integrated way. So this research is 
a lot of people don't like this research because when it's um, when you take it sort of just the, the negatives, it can sound very depressing and scary, but actually this research is really helpful and really hopeful. So the reasons why is that once you understand that, um, once you understand why these problems are occurring, once you understand that they're all linked together, it suddenly gives you the key to start unlocking things. So what we're going to talk about in the second half of today is around kind of building relationships, it's around thinking about learning emotion regulation skills. So rather than, for example, saying, oh, well, you know, you've got all these different problems and you're stuck and you're not engaging and we can't do anything with you. It's about saying, okay, if we look at this through a complex trauma lens, we've suddenly got some solutions here. We can help you, we know what to do. And the same piece of research um, looked at what they call benevolent childhood experiences. So these are positive things that happen in your childhood. And what's lovely is that they're, they're quite small things. It was things like having one adult who you trust, having fun at school, having something that you know you feel good at so that you get a good uh, sense of self, having a routine, just kind of knowing that you're gonna go home and have dinner. So these benevolent childhood experiences, when you look at the statistics, really offset that link. So the more positive um, stuff that you had in your life, the, the less likely you were to experience those negative outcomes in adulthood. So what that means is that someone might have grown up in a really difficult household, that they might have had a lovely nan, or they might have just had a teacher that they really liked. And then that it was really protective so that they then didn't go on to, to start using substances. They didn't drop out of school because they had those relatively small things in the grand scheme of things, but things that were really important. And this gives us the clues about what, what do we do to help people break this link. So if the damage here has been done relationally and over time, the healing needs to be done relationally over time. And I'm gonna come back to that point. But those benevolent childhood experiences are things that we can do in our services, whether you're working with children or adults, it's never too late to break this, this link. Um, so being the adult they can trust, providing a routine, giving a positive sense of self. And again, we're gonna, we're gonna come on to sort of practical ways of doing that. The final thing I'll say on this, the other thing that broke the link between how many ACEs you've experienced and the outcomes in adulthood was what psychologists call emotion regulation skills. Now, the great thing about this is you can teach people emotion regulation skills. So although, you know, this is not something that's prioritized in our services, in our job roles, unless you are a therapist, um, I think it's an absolutely crucial addition um, both for staff to be using practicing for themselves but also to teach for the people that you're supporting because if you can ma if you can learn to manage your emotions then again that can offset that link between the traumas we've experienced in the past and the, the negative impacts of those in our futures so we're going to come back to all of those things but that's the overview of why understanding how childhood trauma leads to these things is so important for our services and our service structures as well. So psychologically informed environments, um, if you are implementing these, what you want to see is that your staff are feeling safer, your staff are feeling more effective and more empowered. So again, PIs are not just, just about the clients, it's very much about the staff as well. And you'll see reduced staff burnout and reduced staff turnover. So the whole environment is more empowering for everybody. You're trying to break that cycle of trauma and homelessness. So that's everything I was just saying on the last slide. So actually understanding where, where these issues have come from, understanding why people have got stuck in this, in this cycle, why their you know, attachment styles and interpersonal safety strategies that they've learned have caused them to get evicted over and over again and how to approach them in a different way so that you can actually break that cycle. Um, and that's kind of, you know, through reducing evictions, reducing incidents so that people can uh, sustain tenancies if they're in independent accommodation or um, you know, not, not get evicted so often if they're in accommodation services. And then while, while we're in services, because there's a lot of revolving door that happens in our, in our um, sector. So while we've got people, it's not just about putting a roof over their head and then moving them on within a set time frame. It's about 
making meaningful changes, start sowing seeds. So with many of our, you know, the people that we're supporting, we might not be able to transform people's lives within a year or two years, but we can start to make changes so that when they do move on, they can build on that. We've laid some foundations at least. Um, the harder outcomes, so looking at kind of KPIs and things that you might want to be measuring, uh, we are looking for improved mental and physical health outcomes. And again, that comes through that increased engagement um, and, and the relationships that they're building with staff, reduce substance use um, and reduce statutory service use. So you might get less ambulance call outs, less police call outs. So PI should have, you know, from the soft outcomes to those harder outcomes that the commissioners are going to like, um, over time, and I'm, I'm talking over many years, you, you'll start to see more and more of these outcomes happening, but it does not happen overnight. <laughs> it takes a long time to actually embed this and get these, um, these outcomes visibly going. So how do you know if you're pie? There are lots of different outcome measures that you might want to use. Um, you can use measures of staff burnout. You can use measures of um, how well people are able to reflect. Um, there's a very lengthy and jargony trauma-informed um, self-assessment tool, but the one I'm going to talk about today is called Pizzazz, and it's the official, in quotes, self-assessment tool because it was the one that uh, Robin Johnson uh, and his colleagues, who came up with the, the current PI framework as we know it, they came up with this self-assessment tool. And it's something that, uh, it's, not, it's not even an outcome measure. It is a qualitative tool that requires quite a lot of buy-in from the team and actually a lot of time to do. So when I did this with my team in the hostel, we spent kind of several sessions over a few weeks. We probably spent about 10 hours in total doing this. Um, the shortest time I've ever done this in with the team was six hours over three sessions. So you really, you want to get people's buy-in for this. And, and then the great thing about this tool is that you can repeat it. So you do end up rating yourself on the different areas, um, but it's done in a really positive way so that you're setting yourself goals and thinking, okay, well, how can we better at this? And then you come back to it in a year's time and hopefully you look at the actions that you set and you can tick some off and you might want to increase your, your rating. So I'll come back to that in a second when I talk about the, the service that I was in. So the tool covers the five areas of PI. So as I said, the model of PI is broken down into five. And this is actually, it's called PI 2.0. So they rejigged it a little bit um, because they, you know, they wanted to evolve it so that it reflected the most useful areas to cover. PI 1.0 had relationships as a category, but actually relationships come into every single category of this. So that's why they decided to change it. And then relationships is just all encompassing. So the first area is about the spaces of opportunity. So it may be the physical environment. If you are an accommodation service or a day centre, it's going to be about things like, you know, is there a quiet place for people to go? Um, there's some quite good trauma-informed literature around um, making spaces trauma-informed, so chairs in corners where people um, feel sort of contained um, and feel like there's something behind them, so that if you're very hypervigilant, you can just see what's in front of you rather than feeling like there's people behind you, having nice green open spaces, um, just having a pleasant environment, because if we're in an environment that feels dirty or unclean or unsafe, um, that doesn't create a sense of, of physical safety for us. But actually, that's a much smaller element of this area. And spaces of opportunity really is much more about what does the space feel like to be in? So if you were doing a self-assessment tool, you might ask staff, how would you feel if you were living here, if it's an accommodation service? What if you had to hang out here for the day? What if you had to spend a weekend here, sleeping here? How would you feel? And what we want is to be working towards a place where staff would be like, oh, yeah, no, I'd quite like to hang out here for a day, you know, nice pool table, some nice social spaces. Um, so how conducive is the space to feeling comfortable, feeling safe? And also how conducive is it to interpersonal interaction? So are staff locked away in an office and always behind their computer screens or are they around? 
you know, do we spend time just chatting to people, engaging them, seeing if someone wants to you know, play chess with us for a bit? So that's spaces of opportunity. Developing the framework I've already spoken about. So do we have an understanding of trauma, an understanding of attachment theory? Which tools are we going to use? Are we, are we going to use? Do we need any tools? For some, some services, you might genuinely not need to use tools. There might be some basic understanding that's helpful, but actually you don't need as much. Whereas for other services, you might want some really specific tools to use as a team. The three R's, rules, roles and responses. This is about how are we responding to people when um, you know, a rule is broken? What are the rules? How are we um, supporting people to understand what the behavioural rules are in our, um, in our service so that people can feel relationally safe? Do the people using our service understand what our roles are? Do we understand what our roles are? <laughs> Am I clear on what my role in today's shift is? Um, and can the people using our services actually get involved as well? Can, can they have some roles and some empowerment? So there's loads in this one, um, but those, that's the sort of the general theme of the three R's. Then as you can see, two out of five areas are all about staff. Staff training and support, absolutely crucial. And again, just after the break, I've got a little graphic about levels of intervention and I'll underline this point again there that if, if the team aren't supported, you've got no chance of the clients being supported because the team are containing the clients. So they need to feel safe. They need to feel supported first and foremost so that they can then contain and support the clients effectively. And then learning and inquiry. So Pi talks about moving away from a shame and blame culture and towards learning and inquiry culture. And again, this requires a, a, a lot of psychological safety, a lot of relational safety. So if I make a mistake in my service, do I feel safe to put my hand up and go, oh, I, I've done this wrong, or I, I shouldn't have done, done it that way. Um, can we learn from that and explore what happened and next time improve on it? Or am I scared? Am I thinking, oh God, I can't tell anyone you know, this, I need to hide it, I need to cover it up, I'm going to get fired, I'm going to get told off. Um, so well, the atmosphere of the service really matters for this one. And the other thing that comes in here is about evaluating outcomes as well. So about um, are we feeding into kind of general practice? Are we, um, um, are we, Show, are we monitoring our outcomes? Are we showing that actually the things that we're doing um, are contributing to those soft outcomes and hard outcomes that we had on the previous slide? So I'm going to talk a little bit now about where I used to work. So this is a, one of the large homeless hostels in central London, and I was employed by the charity, by SHP. Um, and it was an all male, uh, I think, complex needs service. Again, psychologists don't love this term in general, but the, the service, was, I think it was like named as a complex needs service, uh, meaning that all the individuals who were residents there had um, multiple mental health problems, physical health problems, substance use, uh, significant substance use. So I was working there three days a week, um, and I spent about three and a half years there embedding pie into the service culture. So again, making the point that this takes a really long time. And there were a lot of times when it felt like we were going backwards or it wasn't landing. Um, it, it's not easy to do this culture shift. It takes a lot of patience and a lot of persistence to do this. Um, but for us, what was really crucial was the manager buy-in. Um, so where, you know, you've got psychologically informed managers, you're going to much more easily be able to put things in place because they're already going to be working in a way that's conducive to being a psychologically informed environment. In-house psychology is a luxury, uh, so most services won't have that, but I have to say it was beneficial being on site because you know, this is a service where there are frequently lots of incidents, lots of issues, um, and actually having me there to really support the team and just hold the the trauma informed staff, the psychologically informed staff. So my job was to be a bit of a broken record in discussions, and I was, you know, always reminding people. 
since then I've worked with trauma. Um, so having someone there to do that is really helpful. And in a team that you, you don't have an in-house psychologist, it might be about having a pie champion uh, or a few people who are just holding that in their mind so that they can be the ones piping up and handovers going, oh, have we thought about the, the impact of trauma on that behaviour? Um, so it is really beneficial. And what we saw over time was that, yeah, we still had incidents, we still had evictions, but the team were happy. The team felt supported, um, really low staff turnover um, by the time I left. Like the team, people wanted to come and work for the service and they didn't want to leave. People would come in on placements and then want a job or come in to do locum and then want a job, permanent job with the team uh, because of the atmosphere because it, uh, the team felt empowered, the team were really enjoying their work, even, even though it was incredibly difficult on many days, um, they felt empowered, they felt effective. Some of the things that I did um, within those three years to achieve this, so we implemented regular reflective practice, and again, the benefit of having me in-house was that we ended up doing that fortnightly rather than um, monthly, which many services uh, I think that's kind of the industry standard. We did complex case discussions in addition to reflective practice. So every other week, we would sit down for a whole hour and talk about one resident uh, and think about their history, think about, um, you know, just hypothesizing about why, think, why, why they might be stuck, or why there might have been an incident, um, and what do to move past that from a psychological trauma-informed perspective. Um, so again, hold, holding our ideas lightly, but generating new ideas and new approaches against a sort of unstick people uh, and the team in terms of how we're working with people. And what was lovely, one of the most rewarding things for me, was that by the time I left, the team had become pretty much self-sufficient doing these things. So when I started, the complex case discussions were very much led by me. Uh, and by the end, I honestly didn't have to say very much. I'd sit there and I'd listen to the team just, you know, coming up with all of the points themselves, uh, using all of their knowledge about trauma and attachment theory and everything else that we've been sort of teaching them over the last three years. Um, and if I was off sick, if I wasn't there, they didn't need me to do it. And that was really lovely to see. So they, they'd really kind of taken that on and become empowered to, to do that for themselves. And even the reflective practices, um, at times when I wasn't there and they just self facilitate it and still make really good use of the space. Uh, we also had lots of focus on positive activities. So this is this was through the pandemic. I was working here 2018 through to 2021. Even through the pandemic, we managed to have, um, you know, the, those positive activities and getting buy in from the staff to understand that they're not extras. They're actually really core cool to what we do. And I'll talk um, about why that is important at the end of the session today. We empowered staff and residents. So um, the the staff were, you know, made um, sort of champions of different things. So somebody was really good at, you know, doing informed stuff. Someone was really good at move on. Someone else was really good at something else. Um, and then we'd encourage people to share those skills and upskill each other, so that people felt like they had. A place in the team that they knew what they were um, sort of good at and equally with residents well how can we include people in the service in a way not that's tokenistic but that's really empowering so that people feel like they can, they can get involved have some positive responsibility that they they've chosen um, and then we can give them that positive reinforcement um, and then for me being there as well just that staff support I did see clients for individual therapy but I have to say it was the, the minority of my job, the, the most important part of my job, in my opinion, was upskilling and supporting the team. Um, and then the service procedures. So again, we'll talk more about this in the second half of today, but just constantly reflecting on why are we doing this this way? Is this for the psychological needs of people or is it because this was, came from you know, something bureaucratic that actually doesn't make that much sense in practice? So we did our pizzazz. Um, we did it twice. We did it once in 2020 and once in 2021. And as I said, it, it took several sessions, but the staff really bought into it. And when we did it for the second time, we ticked off so many actions and we were mid pandemic in 2021. But it was so uplifting, as you'll see in a second from the next couple of slides, 
it was so uplifting because the team were like, wow, look what we've done. Even through the pandemic, we've achieved all these actions. And we ended up rating ourselves a level higher on each of the, the sections. Um, and the, the team, well, I'll, I'll go on to this when I, the, when I show you the next couple of slides, but the team really felt like they developed professionally and they also sort of stepped back and said, oh, wow, this pie thing actually works because we can see how we've improved. Um, so the, the pizzazz was really helpful. And we got client feedback as well while doing the pizzazz. And the client feedback echoed the gains that we were seeing, but also um, a piece of research that I'm now gonna tell you about briefly. So the other thing that we had that we were very lucky to have was a master's student who was doing, uh, she was doing forensic and clinical psychology. And she came to do her placement with me and she did her dissertation. So the topic of her dissertation was around staff experiences of conducting the pizzazz. So this self-assessment tool that we did together. Um, she interviewed everyone at the hostel. Um, and in the next few slides, I'm gonna run through her, her findings, her themes. So she, she found four main themes uh, that came out. And what was interesting is some of them were about the pizzazz, but actually a lot of the content of the interview was more about pie in general. So her first theme, um, that people spoke a lot about was the fact that actually having implemented PI over the previous few years, that had led to really ch tangible positive changes. And the one that came up most was about client engagement. So here's a sample quote. Um, Despite again being in lockdown, Natalie, psychologist, had her best outcomes from one-to-ones with clients. So I was actually working remotely at this point, but I had my best engagement because the, the clients started to trust us, the team were on board with this. Um, so even though I wasn't physically there, uh, I was managing to see, I think it was like eight to ten clients a week, which was unprecedented uh, compared to before I was struggling to see one client a week when I, when I started. Still being able to facilitate activities appropriately when risk assessed, I think meaning COVID risk assessed here and as well as regular risk assessment. So we, kept, we carried on trying to do those activities where we could, kept being set back by COVID, we kept trying. Um, so actually when, when we did our contract monitoring, we had our best outcomes. So the commission was really happy. Um, so this person says, that's amazing, the fact that we've been able to do that despite the world being shut the way that the clients engage with us, communicate with us. I feel like you trust us a little bit more. So again, you can see where it's landed. It's taken a long time, but the clients are now actually feeling supported. They feel like they can trust us. We've proved ourselves to them. The second theme was around the team understanding the clients better. So this, I think, came directly from our complex case discussions that we had. And although it is helpful to have that being led by a psychologist, it doesn't need to be. Um, you can still kind of after some sort of basic training around trauma and attachment theory, you can we can draw all those ideas in um, to team discussions, even if they're not scaffolded. Um, and what usually happened with our complex case discussions is when we got to the bit where we were talking about, OK, well, based on our current understanding of what's going on with this behavior or this engagement what can we do differently through a trauma-informed lens and more often than not well I say more often than not I'd say always there would be something in there around um what's this client interested in what are their strengths how can we engage them positively um, and what can what can we then reinforce positively as well because that's something that creates the change so a couple of quotes here um, just giving more positive client engagement, positive reinforcement, working with people's strengths, having that strength-based approach, I think is at the heartbeat of what this team is trying to do. And I think the clients are responding to that. So you're not just trying to do, you're seeing the actual responses. Um, and again, I, I was a broken record for three and a half years, but people did in the end really appreciate the, the knowledge. So someone else said, these psychological theories integrating into what we're doing really helps to get a bit of an understanding when you're working with someone and looking at the big picture. You know, the cycle of people coming in and out of hostels that's linked to trauma. So, you know, those kinds of psychological understandings, attachment theory, understanding trauma really helps when you're working with those people not to be judgmental to work in a way that's patient 
and also psychologically informed and understanding. So as I said earlier, having the understanding of, for example, attachment theory, at the very least, helps staff to stay connected with their empathy, not to get frustrated, not to feel stuck so much. And then the final um, two sets of um, themes that my trainee had, one was around um, the pizzazz itself helps staff to see their professional development and feel supported. So this was around Pi and pizzazz. Um, so me being there, but also just be working the strengths based way within the team. Uh, the team were very, very, very supportive of each other and that helps get them through the difficult times. Uh, and then regarding the pizzazz specifically, someone said, when you reflect back, it really shows the level of progress that you've made. And then linked to that, the team were talking about getting this sense of achievement and this sense of positive forward momentum, specifically from doing the pizzazz. So someone wanted to do them quarterly instead of yearly. And given how many sessions we spent on it, that's really saying something because it was this big piece of work. They loved it so much and found it so positive that they wanted to do it even more. Um, and people reflect that actually, you know, the other other services will benefit from this. So, you know, we've really enjoyed this. It's really helped us, and actually, other places would benefit from it as well. So that's my first section. So I've ma I've managed to keep the time almost exactly. So we were going to have a comfort break now because I know you're all in this conference for the whole day. Um, so have ten minutes, and then we'll come back at um, half past. Um, for you guys, obviously, your uh, um, cameras are off anyway, so you don't need to go anywhere. Just uh, come back to me at half past.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Hopefully you've um, grabbed some refreshments and are ready for, for part two of the session. Um, please, as I said, do um, ask me questions in the Q&A. We've got one question so far, um, but with, with Pi, there's always lots of um, sort of questions and thoughts around um, finding the balance between things, which we'll talk a little bit about, but um, I imagine that in your services, all the contexts are different. Um, so do ask me questions if you're thinking about how to relate this to your own services, and hopefully we can um, get some sort of interaction going that way. So this next section is um, just some tips really on practical ways of implementing Pi in your service, wherever you work, whether you're floating support, whether you're housing first, whether you're an accommodation service, um, whoever you are, wherever you are, um, you should be able to take something from this section. And it's, it's certainly not exhaustive, uh, but there's just a few of my top tips. So. I wanted to briefly speak first about the levels of intervention. So again, often PI is seen as something which just applies to the clients, so the individuals that we're supporting in our services. Um, but it's far more than that. And this comes to the idea of containment that I mentioned earlier. So the client, in terms of containment and support, lies in the centre, in, in my mind, of these concentric circles. So the team are immediately around the client, supporting them. So all of you working on the front line, that's you face to face with clients. But for, the, for you to do that, you need to be supported by all the upper layers as well. So around the team, you've got managers. So managers are scaffolding, supporting, training, empowering their staff members so that the staff members can support the clients. But then the managers need support too, because you know we're all human beings. So the organization has to support the managers. And this isn't just about the individuals, this is also around organizational policies and procedures. Um, I'll, I'll give an example often um, when there are really unfortunate circumstances, like a client passes away, uh, or there's a really serious incident, where there's a really clear policy and procedure about what to do that really helps to contain the manager, the team, uh, the service around what to do and instances where an organisation haven't had that clear policy and procedure, um, the, the staff have been much more likely to struggle uh, with those um, incidents. Um, and then the system. So one thing that um, Actually, I didn't mention it when I was talking about ACEs, but it's very much relevant. It's not just about your individual experience with your sort of immediate nuclear family. Your likelihood of experiencing all of those adverse childhood experiences that we mentioned earlier is very much couched in the context of society. Poverty, discrimination, these social issues are going to make, are going to impact on ACEs, on, on their likelihood, on their severity. Um, so we, we have to be thinking about the system as well when if we're, if we're trying to be a psychologically informed system. Um, so as I mentioned, when I was working, although I was actually on the front line working in house and homeless hospital and I had access to 68 clients, I couldn't see 68 clients a week realistically. And not only that, but actually many of the clients wouldn't have benefited from direct psychology. Um, what they did all benefit from though, as I said, was me training, supporting and upskilling the team. So that the team, the team of the people who are working with clients all week. So what I can do in an hour with somebody, and it certainly wouldn't be a weekly hour because, you know, people aren't going to see me every week. They might see me once every four weeks. Um, and that's not really going to make that much impact over the long term. But if you can get the whole service, the whole atmosphere, to feel safe, to feel relationally and psychologically safe with people, that's when you're going to start seeing better outcomes. That's when you're going to see the changes in the client group. And then when we're thinking about the system, we can think about building links as well. So even as a team, it's linking outwards. It's what's our relationship like with our commissioners? Do they understand what we're trying to do here? Do they get the values? And actually, can, are, the, are the targets that they're giving us realistic and taking into account of this approach that we're trying to use here. 
what's our relationship like with statutory services? There's a lot of splitting in our sector between you know, the CMHT and the substance use services and then the sort of a third sector, the charities who are supporting the clients and hostels or with floating support. Um, clients getting bounced around between different services. So can we integrate these services? Can we come together? Can we work together? And I'm sure you'll all relate that the best outcomes that we see with the people that we're supporting is when we've had that really effective multi-agency working where people have come together um, to actually meet the needs of the, of the clients. Have we got the police, you know, on side? Because police don't, unfortunately, don't get an, enough training and support around um, this sort of topic. Uh, I think there's, you know, there's some out there. Um, and certainly some teams that we've worked with in Westminster are fantastic and really trauma informed. And again, we've had really good outcomes where we've been able to kind of engage them with the hostel. So somebody is being arrested, you know, constantly for the same thing, or somebody's always calling the police can we step back and actually come up with a supportive intervention um, rather than just keeping them stuck in that cycle and again the local community can we get people um, can we shift that stigma can we move away from this kind of fear um, and, and help people connect in the local community so this is illustrated in this graphic. This is I, I found this graphic on Instagram, but I think it's fantastic and um, just reminds us that actually a lot of what we actually work with day to day um, is very much couched in the medical model. Uh, we sort of we pathologize all these um, different issues, but when you dig beneath, there are some serious issues in society that need addressing in order to support uh, the types of change, the types of recovery that we're looking for. For people so if somebody's been experiencing lots of inequality oppression discrimination poverty injustice throughout their life the system's let them down over and over and over again of course they've got stuck in this revolving cycle of course they don't trust us of course they don't want to engage with us they're expecting to be let down as they have been so many times before so we really need to be thinking about changing you know as a whole society as a whole sector um and then the the surface issues that we are trying to address so somebody's substance use needs or their mental health difficulties can then be much more easily addressed and unpicked so top tip number one is about reflection so this is something that just needs to happen all the time now i say this this is kind of an ideal obviously we can't be reflecting all the time because we never get any work done and sometimes we do have to just respond really quickly to a crisis or sort of just get on with something but as much as possible psychological awareness needs to be integrated on a daily basis in as many ways as it possibly can be so whether that's personal staff reflection in handovers and team meetings and reflective practice sessions so mini example you know if you're sitting in a handover in the morning a non-psychologically informed handover might be something like you know client y came down last night was shouting and swearing um and he's been issued a warning a more psychologically informed version of that handover would be so and so was really distressed last night. Um, that resulted in them shouting at staff. Um, actually, we, we were aware that, that was a really difficult anniversary for them. Um, so we need to check in on them today. We will need to talk to them about the language that they were using. But also, we someone you know wants to offer them support because we're aware of this anniversary. So you're you're immediately looking beneath the iceberg. What's going on? Can we understand what happened? Yes, there need has to be consequences when necessary. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but also, you know, we're understanding, we're supporting. For staff, we need this awareness of vicarious trauma, awareness of burnout, awareness of moral injury. This is a, a related concept that people are, are not so familiar with. Um, and we've just developed a brand new training on this, which um, I think is a really, really important uh, topic for staff to just know about. Uh, the training is really experiential, so we actually think about the the moral injuries that we are um, facing day to day because it's it's kind of inherent in our sector um, and how to how to mitigate that how to manage that so that it doesn't then lead to burnout trauma or other difficulties um, and this comes up every day and what we're doing we are um, you know working with systems who we're expecting to support us or our clients and then you know 
getting let down by that. So that's a moral injury because our, our values, our expectations about what should and will be done have not been met. Um, if you have to evict somebody to the street, that's a moral injury because you're protecting the well-being of the service, but you don't want to, somebody to be on the street. Your value is that you want to house people and support people. Uh, working with perpetrators, again, can be a moral injury where you know that this person is vulnerable and you want to support them, but the actions that they've taken in the past have, you know, run up against your morals and values. So we hold this every day uh, and actually being aware of that um, is really, really important for, for positive staff wellbeing. And when it comes to the people that we're supporting in our services, it's not just about psychological awareness, it's actually looking even more holistically and looking at all the contributing factors. So yes, trauma and psychology, uh, but the physiological impacts of substance use, uh, other physical health conditions, head injuries, neurodiversity, intellectual disabilities, so much of this is undiagnosed as well. Um, their general well-being. So I mean, you know, have they not eaten all week? If I miss one meal, I'm irritable and you know, not functioning very well. And we're working with people who are who are not eating, who are not sleeping. Um, Developing this culture of curiosity and learning, again, we've already mentioned, but throughout the organisation. So I often hear people higher up in organisations saying like, oh, we don't need reflective practice, we're not frontline. Um, but actually, hopefully from the previous graphic, you can understand that everybody needs to be reflecting. Um, and actually, even more importantly, if you're you know, a manager or a lead or a CEO of an organization, um, it's really important that you're reflecting on, you know, how are we doing with this? Are we, is the practice on the front line reflecting our values? Are our policies and procedures reflecting um, that we're psychologically informed? Are they trauma informed? Um, can we do any more about, you know, working effectively with commissioners, with other services? If I'm an organization and I've got 30 services spread out across the country, is my offer consistent across all of my services? Do they all have the same resources? So that level of reflection, it's gonna be a bit different if you're at the top, but uh, it's still really, really important. So finding a balance is the next top tip, and this leads on directly from reflection. So why do we need to reflect all the time? Because with pie, there is not usually any one right answer. So a nice example that came up in a training I did last week was around, um, what do you do when a client shouts at you? I don't know. It depends on the client and it depends on the circumstance. So the example that we were working through was like, okay, maybe that client's just shouting because they're very intoxicated. They're intoxicated to the point where you know you can't rationalise them. So a really great way of dealing with that would be distraction. Like, hey, come over here and talk to me about the football. Let's go for a walk outside, come on. Um, because that's going to effectively de-escalate the situation. If a client is sort of upset about life and shouting, but I'm not feeling like it's directed at me, I might decide, actually, do you know what? I'm going to allow this person to express their distress and validate it and hold it. Because what I'm doing there is I'm building that relationship. I'm, I'm supporting that person to understand that I can contain their rage. I'm not scared. I'm not going to run away. I'm not going to reject them. Um, and see, so over time, you don't want that to become a pattern. But it might be that you listen and you validate. And, and a third example might be the client is shouting at me, being directly abusive to me. And in that case, I take myself out of that situation because my safety comes first. You should not be feeling unsafe or abused in your jobs. Um, and then we come back to that later and work out, you know, what happened, what can we do uh, to support this person and it does there need to be a sanction, a consequence. So the answer to that one question is so nuanced, depends on the situation. So here are some of some examples. And again, there's so many of these, but some common examples that come up of dichotomies where you've got to find this middle ground. You've got to work it out depending on the situation. So understanding attachment theory. We know that we want um, to give people time to engage with us slowly. So people have been let down over and over and over again by their caregivers in the past and by the system as they've gone through it. So they don't, of course they don't trust us, why would they? So we want to allow people to learn to trust us slowly. Oh, but wait, we have KPIs. <laughs> I, I, this client moved in a month ago and I haven't done my support plan yet and my dashboard is red. How do I find this balance? How do I, you know, 
engage them. They need to come and do some actual paperwork with me. I can't just take them to coffee forever. Another one that's again linked to relationships is that we know that relationships are actually absolutely key to our work. Um, but we need to hold professional boundaries. We're not clients' friends, we're not clients' family. They will be moving on from our services. So again, I often hear staff saying, oh, don't get attached. Don't form a relationship with people. And it's not that simple. You have to find that middle ground. You do have to, the clients need some attachment to the service. Um, and most likely, you know, within that service, they'll probably have a key worker or a few staff members who are their more primary attachment figures in that service. But we all need to understand that those attachments have professional boundaries around them. And that's really tricky. That takes, you know, day to day thought about where are our boundaries? What are we, what are we doing? How are we managing this relational dynamic? A great example I always use here is like um, thinking of teachers, because most people can relate to that. So, again, um, something that comes up a lot is, you know, people are moving on. So, um, you know, key workers leave, clients leave. So I don't want to trust you in the first place. It's coming from clients because you're going to leave me um, or staff being like, how can we build up that relationship? And then they move on and then it's broken, it's ruptured. But if you think of teachers that you've had in the past, I bet you can all think of one teacher who had a, a huge impact on your life. Maybe you internalized positives that they gave you, took that relationship with you, sort of the internalized version of that relationship. But that was a 10 month relationship. It was always gonna end and you knew that from the start, but it doesn't mean that person didn't have a huge impact on you uh, and planted seeds and laid foundations that you then built on with other teachers in the future. So that's, that's an example I use that helps people get their head around that. A third one is this idea of, um, oh, no, we don't want to be doing that for people because we're trying to help them to become independent. And, uh, you know, if we give them food, then what are they going to do when they move out? They're going to have to buy their own food. So there's, you know, I see where that argument is coming from. But actually, we understand, uh, again, from a psychologically informed perspective, that in order to become dependent, you need to have had a healthy experience of dependency first. And many of our clients never had that. There's this unmet developmental need there. And this goes back to the sort of the timeline thing, because for some people, actually, they need years of being able to kind of form that healthy dependency. And we don't have years. So it's like, how are we grading this? We might we might need to initially do things for people. But then what are we working towards? At what point are we going to start doing it with and then gradually giving them more and more so that they're building the independence rather than expecting people to be independent right from the start? So all of these dichotomies, there's so many more. This is just a few examples. But the reason is that the reason that you need to be reflecting and thinking about all of these aspects of your the nuances of your service delivery day to day, week to week is because there are all these psychotopies and you have to work out how to find a good balance. We also need to be constantly reflecting on these three things or focusing on these three things. So as I said earlier, if we're saying that the problem has been caused relationally and over a long time, then the healing needs to happen relationally and over a long time. So in, in a sense, we are trying to give people what they didn't get um, in their lives. So a secure relationship, an adult who they could trust and feel safe with, going back to those benevolent childhood experiences I mentioned earlier. And then consistency and boundaries. So this is the answer to another question I get a lot, which is, you know, if we're pie, does that mean that, you know, the people who are using our services can just do whatever they want and there's never any consequences? No. Nobody, nobody needs that. Children, adults, we all need boundaries around us in order to feel safe. Nobody thanks you for putting in boundaries. I, I've never heard a three-year-old say, oh, thank you so much for not letting me have chocolate before dinner. Um, but over time, boundaries make people feel a lot safer because they know what to expect whether that's to do with sort of rules or whether that's just to do with interpersonal expectations. So if a client um, knows that they, you know, these are your working hours and they can't contact you out of those working hours, sticking to that boundary will over time make people feel safe. And sometimes we feel guilty holding those boundaries, but we need to remember that we're, we're doing the right thing in the long term. And with boundaries, it's absolutely crucial that they're held consistently. 
they need to be consistent across the team so if a client comes to me and says can you make me a cup of tea and I say no because we've agreed as a team that I'm not going to and again the reason for that needs to be psychologically informed not because that's convenient for the team um, but that needs to be sort of thought through in a psychologically informed way so if I've said no because that's what we've agreed as a team and then they go to my colleague and they say yes we're going to end up with splitting we're going to end up with kind of difficulties and, and conflicts within the team and between you know clients and the team because now this client's had a cup of tea and that client hasn't so it almost it, it to an extent doesn't matter what the agreed procedure is but what does matter is consistency so this is a little graphic which shows a phased treatment approach to trauma. Now, this is a graphic for psychologists. If somebody came to me for trauma treatment, these are the three phases I'd go through. I'd start off with stabilization and symptom management. That means I'm helping people to learn how to, so for example, uh, manage their flashbacks. And the reason this is really important is because if you try to do trauma therapy when somebody isn't stable, isn't safe, that can really escalate risk because trauma therapy involves sort of touching into trauma and, and bringing things up and actually can make people feel worse before it makes them feel better. So you have to spend as a psychologist quite a long time teaching people tools to, to manage their trauma symptoms, manage their flashbacks, reduce panic attacks, for example, and do what we call a psychologist psychoeducation. So just explaining the basics of what trauma is. The other things around stabilisation are, does this person have food and a home, um, a roof over their head? Because again, I, you, you can't do trauma therapy effectively with somebody if they're not uh, you know, physically safe, that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, if they're hungry and sleeping on the street, they're not going to be able to engage effectively in that kind of therapy. And then throughout the whole process, there's a lot around integrating back into the community so we do not live in silos we're designed to be social creatures so trauma can be really isolating and actually forming meaningful connections with the community is um, crucial to help people get real meaningful social support and actually integrate back into society in a, in a in a way that's going to support their well-being going forward and actually strengthen their recovery so if this is for psychologists, why am I talking to you about it? Because actually two thirds of this, you guys do. Whether you're a, a project worker, whether you're a hostel manager, um, you're doing two thirds of this. Your jobs are all about making, stabilizing people in their lives, making sure that they have access to housing and benefits and you know, food, whether it's because you've got food where you are uh, working or whether it's food vouchers or signposting people to where they can get food or helping people think about taking them shopping so this kind of stabilization stuff is what you do and the community integration it's a huge part of what we do in our services is about linking people in with the community helping people to sort of you know feel like they're part of society again access to training access to work access to volunteering and activities so I, I like this because it helps you guys to feel really empowered. So people often say to me, sort of in, in the day-to-day -day work, um, oh, this client has trauma, you need to see them. No, I probably don't, because if, if people aren't stable, um, in, while I was working at the hostel for three and a half years, not once did I do trauma therapy with anyone. I thought I was going to. When I took the job, I was like, yeah, I can do trauma therapy with all these people. And nobody was stable enough. Nobody, because the substance use was too high, the risk was too high. I spent three and a half years just doing stabilization with the team and with the clients. And I'm not saying that was a waste of time. That was absolutely crucial. I realized that that was where I needed to focus. And there's most of what I did could have been done and ended up being done by the whole team, not just me. So the, the next part that I'm going to talk about I'm not telling anyone to go and play therapist or play psychologist. What I'm saying is that you can feel empowered, but actually you are working with trauma, but in a way that's kind of within anybody's remit, um, rather than a specialist therapy that a psychologist needs to do or a therapist needs to deliver. So the, the most important, in my opinion, example of this is about 
upskilling people in terms of how they regulate your emotion. So when you've experienced complex trauma, um, you've got a double whammy here. So you've got, you've grown up, your fight and flight system's been on high all the time. And that means that as an adult, you're likely to experience those negative emotions actually more intensely. So your anger is really intense. Your, your anxiety is really intense. But on the flip side of that, you haven't had those opportunities to develop any emotion regulation skills internally because you didn't have an adult helping you to identify how you're feeling for a start. And then initially, you know, adults meet our needs for us. So you're hungry, you get fed. You're scared, you get cuddled. And you learn optimally that, okay, I'm feeling this really unpleasant thing, but I can identify what it is and someone's going to do something about it and I'm going to feel better. And then over time, we internalize that ability. So you see toddlers, don't you? They fall over and they rub their own knee and they say, there, there, it's okay. And then they carry on playing. And we learn that we can then self soothe So we actually internalize those abilities to regulate our own fear and our own sadness. Um, and we learn when to do that for ourselves and when to reach out for help. So when to seek social support, because that's a healthy thing that we want to learn to do. But a lot of the clients we work with haven't had those developmental processes. So they've got all these really intense, uncomfortable emotions that they're struggling to label, to identify and to manage other than through something like substance use. So this idea is important for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's important, um, as I said, for explicit emotion regulation skills. So the good news here is that you can teach these. And when I deliver pie trainings and trauma trainings, there's always a, a big chunk in there about what, what are emotion regulation skills and how can we support people to develop these. So there's a whole range of them, but the, the key ones, which I, again, I'm a broken record about, are um, using breathing. So I'm um, imagining lots of eye rolls, but actually breath is our most important tool because it directly counteracts your fight and flight response. It's slowing your breathing down, will physiologically switch on your soothing system, it will send a little message to your brain to say it's okay, you're safe, creates that biofeedback. So you can, I'm not talking about meditation here, I'm simply talking about slow breathing. If you can get that breath down to five or six breaths a minute, um, and as bonus points, if you can release some tension on those long, slow out breaths, that's another fight and flight symptom that you're counteracting there. And it's very grounding so that you you can just be, be in the moment, slow everything down. Whether you're a staff member or whether you're a client, this is a really important tool to have in your toolkit. So I, I encourage people to do this all the time. Start your handovers with a minute of breathing. Start all meetings with a minute of breathing. Start all key work sessions with a minute of breathing. Do it with people. You have to practice this regularly. You have to get it into people's muscle memory. So even just that one example, if you can practice this with your clients. So again, there's nothing technical or therapisty about this. It's just about, you know, it takes time to win people over on it because almost every single client I've suggested this to has gone like, oh, no, that's cringy. I've done that. It didn't work. Um, and I've had some pushback. But if you can help people to understand why it's really important and actually also model it yourself, you're giving people such an empowering tool because all of a sudden this person is going to be able to stay on the bus um, rather than getting off because they're having a panic attack and they're going to make it to their benefits appointment and not miss the benefits appointment. They're going to manage to stay in the queue at Tesco when they're really frustrated and they're really struggling to wait and actually not shout at the cashier and get barred when they get to the front of the queue. So you're supporting people in a way that's going to have positive impacts on every other aspect of their life here. And most importantly, to start to feel safer in their own body. Because the thing about trauma is that we don't feel safe within ourselves. We're in this safe threat. So actually, if you can help someone to sit and just feel a bit calmer for a minute, that's huge. That's so important. So this, this triangle, what it's saying here, is that we need to start there. When somebody's very dysregulated, very upset, you can't sit and have a productive keyword with them um, because, you know, they can't, they can't concentrate, they can't focus, your attention's scattered when you're very stressed. We need to start off feeling safe. So 
the other part in here is about relating. So you might not be using specific emotion regulation skills. This might be done implicitly through the relationship, through listening, through empathy. So yes, we are there to problem solve, but there will be times when actually what somebody needs from you is just to listen, just to validate them and be like, you know what, I, I'm really sorry you went through that. That sounds really awful. And just have that genuine connection. Um, so that, that's not always going to be appropriate for every interaction, but learning when that relational support, that kind of relational regulation there is going to help people. And if you can do those things, what you'll find is that neurally, neurologically, people's threat system will downregulate, they'll start to feel soothed, and then spontaneously, parts of their brain that are downregulated when they're in, in threat mode, the parts that are responsible for reasoning, problem solving, seeing other people's points of view, will switch on. So, for example, if someone had a conflict with a friend and they're kind of telling you about it, if you focus on validating them first, you might find that after a while, they start spontaneously saying, you know what, actually, I can see that, da, 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 and kind of seeing it from their point of view a little bit without you even having to do that, just because you've related with them, you've validated them, and then that sort of made them feel calmer. And then the final point about this slide is that we need to practice this too so when I'm teaching people emotion regulation skills I always tell people start with yourselves practice these yourselves first before trying to teach it to the clients use them in in your day-to-day -day work do breathing do grounding do thought diffusion well you know whatever it is you want to find helpful practice it and use it because if you're stressed you're going to be far less effective in terms of offering support to somebody else So moving away from the relationships now, so let's think about boundaries. So again, this is a bit of a myth of pie that some people have, that pie means that people can just do whatever they want. Like, oh, well, if I'm saying I understand why this client is shouting at me, then that means that it's fine for them to shout at me. Well, no, we can, we can be understanding and we should be understanding. But as I said earlier, people need boundaries in order to feel safe staff and clients um, so not having any boundaries isn't helpful for people allowing somebody to verbally abuse you for 30 minutes is not helping them because actually they're feeling worse and worse and worse um, and you're not helping them to feel that you're containing that you're you know they're just feeling unsafe and uncontained but it's the way we do it. So to be psychologically informed about this, you might want to reframe rules, which can be quite bureaucratic. And, you know, the word no can be very triggering to people, can't it? So don't do this, don't do that. Um, so you can reframe it to rights and responsibilities, for example. So this idea that actually, right, we as staff members, we're going to treat you with respect. And we, you know, we need you to treat us with respect as well, because we're all human beings. So it's, it's, flattening out these power power hierarchies uh, that people are so used to being on the wrong end of and actually saying like let's all be you know humans together I'll respect you you respect me you know what how can you get involved how do you want to be involved uh, in in the service um so then when somebody does breach uh, you know a rule or an agreed uh, way of being in the service um, we do want to have a sanction but you've really got to think about your sanctions and your rules are they are the rules realistic and are the sanctions appropriate and proportionate so if you've got, if you know you have alcohol dependent clients have you got a rule that you're not allowed to drink in the service is that realistic are you setting people up to fail and what's the sanction for that are you excluding them for 24 hours? So I'm not saying that we should never use exclusions, but again, coming from a trauma-informed perspective, it can be really, really traumatizing because actually the inherent issue here is that people have been excluded. They have been marginalized. They've had these ruptures. So thinking about what are we doing? And I suppose the litmus test is, <laughs> firstly, are you going to follow all the way through on this? So again, using this example of we have alcohol dependent clients, but they're not allowed to drink in the service, and we hand out warning letters every day to them, but we never do anything about it. We're not actually going to evict them. That's not a realistic rule, uh, and the the warning is not worth the paper it's written on because the the you know people know pretty quickly that nothing's going to happen. Um, also. 
this is another pi dilemma, another pi dichotomy. We need to be consistent, but we also need to be personal centered. So if you've got sort of rules that people are supposed to be sticking to, but actually some this applies to some clients, but not others, I question the rule. I we can we nuance it? Can we think about this? What's what are we actually trying to achieve with this? Um, and how can we think about this in a way that is consistent to everybody? When we're children, when rules are, when sanctions are applied, sorry, when we're children, the key thing for sort of good attachment is that the love isn't taken away. So any parents out there, sure you kind of, you know, relate that sometimes you just feel really pissed off and, um, you don't want to talk to your kid for like an hour but actually that in itself that's kind of the attachment is broken there and, and that in itself is a real punishment for a child um so as much as you know we'll all have those times when we're going to be pissed off and we're going to disconnect a little bit um ideally we don't take away the love we let the child know that they've done something wrong and there's going to be a consequence but we still love them and we mirror that in our services where we say you know we have um supportive warning processes don't we so our templates are usually about what happened how can we support you what can we do and then what can you do differently but we need to do that interpersonally too so the interpersonal signals that we're giving off need to show that actually we're still here we want to support you through this um, so not taking away the relationship Positively framing the actions. So you might have some don't do this and that, but then what do you want them to do? What, what do you want them to do instead? Um, so it might be, okay, this client's getting a warning because they smashed the door because they were angry. So thinking that through, can they, you know, before they get to that level of anger, can they come and talk to staff next time? They're starting to feel frustrated so that staff can actually support them or can they go for a walk or can they come and have a cup of tea with you or you know it really depends on the client but what do you want them to do instead and the key thing here is that those are the things that you can positively re reinforce so it's not the warning that changes the behavior it's the follow-up and the positive reinforcement and this is what most teams don't have time to do so you give the warning the behavior improves and you go oh good Whew, forget about it we've now got to deal with this other person's behavior but again, that's not going to change people's behaviour over time. What's going to make a real difference is sitting down with that person after a week or two, not much longer than that, and reviewing it. And actually being able to say to them, you know, maybe there was still a few instances here or there where you shouted at staff, but you know what, we've noticed you really trying. And we've had some really nice chats with you. And actually yesterday, I had a lovely conversation with you and I really enjoyed it. And I felt like you've been, you know, it was a really mutually respectful conversation. So it's that positive reinforcement that's going to kind of register in people's minds because they've been told off and, you know, arrested and excluded over and over and over again. But they might not have had that phrase, that positive reinforcement. Obviously, it has to be genuine. It can't be tokenistic. It has to be real. Um, but that's going to yeah, that's going to help. Endings. So anyone who's experienced lots of trauma will have experienced lots of losses and ruptures in their lives. And actually, a lot of people that we're working with have experienced a lot of early losses, including caregivers. So they go through this pattern where the system ends up perpetuating this so they they've been excluded from school or expelled they've been kicked out of lots of foster homes they've been you know ex evicted from lots of different services so endings become a, a very difficult thing and if you can give somebody a good ending again we haven't done any any psychology with them we're not playing therapists but just by virtue of the fact that you've given someone a positive ending maybe for the first time it's hugely healing it's hugely therapeutic so what do i mean by a good ending i mean an ending where it's actually been attended to where the person has processed their emotions around it and has been able to hold the sadness along with a positive memory so when i left the hospital I was working in, uh, I was lucky enough to give a three month notice period. So leaving time for this is really important. You won't always have three months, but 
or people will often leave it till like the last day to even tell people that they're going and then there's no time there for any processing so I spent three months um, processing with a team and I think I was working individually with about 10 of the residents and miraculously none of those residents disengaged with me I was expecting at least one person to because endings are hard and we, we all want to avoid endings. Um, none of them did. They all came right through to the end, came to the last sessions, were able to say, Do you know what, I'm really sad that you're going. Maybe I'm pissed off at you for leaving as well, like abandoning me like everyone else. But actually, I really appreciate the positive work that we've done together. So holding the sadness and the positives doing this over time this isn't one conversation this is multiple conversations and you might have one conversation talking about sadness another talking about all the things that you've achieved together um one thing that really helps scaffold this and i i did uh, this a lot with clients when they were moving on was a staying well plan so we've got versions of this in our services ready you've got relapse prevention plans but to make it really psychologically informed if someone's moving on from a service use it to go through this process so think with them about positive memories and positive coping strategies that they've already learned with you that they're going to take forward but then also do some sort of preemptive uh, troubleshooting so in in the hostel i was in the ones that came up all the time were things like you're really excited to move on to independent accommodation you know what people also find that quite scary and i wonder if that might come up for you um, and where it often came up was the night before reviewing and people would sabotage it. So if you've already thought that through with a the person, they're far less likely to fall into that trap. Now, what can we do? If we get to the night before and you're feeling suddenly scared, what are we going to do rather than just go and score and use all night and skip the viewing? Can you come and talk to us? Can you use some of those anxieties? Can you use your breathing that we've been practicing? Um, and then equally moving forward as well, so a lot of people move from supported accommodation to independent accommodation and they get really lonely and really bored and then they just go find their friends again who are all using drugs on the street and then boom, they're back in the service. So how can we preempt this? What are you going to do when you're in your lovely new flat and you're bored and you're lonely? How can we, how can we preempt these issues coming up in, in the future? And who else can you go to in the future? So that staying well plan is more about um, the individuals using our services moving on rather than about us moving on, but um, I think that it's a really helpful tool to use. So I mentioned earlier that one of the things that, that we did um, as well as we could, well, it, there were lots of kind of hiccups along the way, but we tried our very best to um, try to give people meaningful activity to engage in day to day. Um, and this comes back into the spaces of opportunity. So we were able to link people in with meaningful initiatives in the community where people would get, you know, they were, would volunteer to do uh, training and say catering, but they'd get training along the way and they'd maybe be an apprenticeship or a job at the other end. Uh, there were ones that were more art based, so sort of film courses that people were able to engage in. And again, there'd be something that they could actually do with that at the end of it. So it felt meaningful for people. They were things that they actually wanted to take part in. And the key thing here is that when you've experienced a lot of trauma, when you are when you're homeless, when you're using substances every day, your sense of self is is so low. You know, you're being treated badly as a child makes you internalize this sense of shame and sort of badness in yourself because when we're children we assume that if we're treated badly it's because we deserve it and even if as adults we learn that that's not actually the case we inherently just carry that sense of shame and defectiveness around inside inside of us um and it, you know people people are so marginalized and excluded from society that they that becomes their identity i am a drug user i am homeless um, so we're working with people with very low self-esteem. So we, how can we expect people to give up the one effective coping strategy that they've got, i.e. substances, um, and recover and move forward in their life if they can't connect with any personal strength, if they're not feeling like they have any sort of agency, if they've never been able to problem solve anything or have a sense of achievement. So when we're talking about doing activities, so many teams who are overstretched and just 
constantly crisis managing all the time have this sense of like I don't have time to do that it's a nice extra thing but it's not the most important thing that we're doing but actually I would argue that it is it's crucial of course you have to do all the crisis management um, but you you need to somehow find some time for this whether it is just sitting with somebody and actually appreciating their poetry or their artwork that they've been doing in their spare time, or whether it is actually linking in someone with, with a training course so that they can start to feel, you know, empowered and, and connected to their strengths and um, sort of assets. Um, that is going to build their positive sense of self and that's going to be really key to helping people have any sort of motivation to recover, to move forward, to build their life back up again. And then finally, culture and diversity. So again, we talk about this all the time, but again, this is so often seen as tokenistic and it's so important thinking back to that infographic that we did, uh, that we did, that we looked at earlier. Um, so actually really bringing this into our consciousness and and if we can do this well then that really helps promote that sense of psychological and relational safety for all of us the staff and the clients uh, so asking clients about their experiences with health and social care acknowledging the historical context people have been in the system for decades and actually acknowledging the pattern that they've been through the systemic failures um, just acknowledging our the, the current limitations of our system. Um, talking about cultural differences with, with clients and how their experiences of discrimination has impacted upon them. Helping staff to identify unconscious biases. Again, this is something that we can do in reflective practices, have these conversations. Um, getting you know everyone involved. So linking to the previous slide, this kind of, getting everyone involved, flattening out those hierarchies, making sure that we do have diversity and that we're sort of celebrating that in our services. So last couple of slides here. So the, the pizzazz and sort of how to do the pizzazz and all the paperwork and all the things about those five areas of pi, you can go onto pylink.net. You do have to create a free account, but then you have access to all the resources, including the pizzazz. Um, so you don't have to pay anything, you just have to sign up. And that's it's a, a bit of a goals mine of information. BGPS, the company that I'm here from today, we deliver a lot of training that is very relevant uh, to this. So this is not an exhaustive list, but we do, we do a, a much fuller training on Pi. We do complex trauma training. I've mentioned complex trauma throughout today. Um, and the emotion regulation skills that I mentioned there, we go through uh, lots of those and how to, how to do those, how to practice those with our clients. Emotion intelligence and resilience, that's about staff wellbeing. Nonviolent communication, a very experiential one about um, sort of good communication. So assertiveness is in there, um, how to have those conversations, how to de-escalate um, situations effectively training about bereavement, addictions, crisis management, moral injury training that I mentioned is on there. Um, we do workshops about boundaries. So again, really practically helping your team, thinking about the boundaries in the team and how to strengthen those and how to kind of figure out where you land on certain, uh, certain different types of boundaries. So as I said, not an exhaustive list, but if you're interested in any of these trainings, if I piqued your interest today and you want to know more about any of these topics, do get in touch with us. Um, you can also utilize the frontline network training fund to access those trainings. Uh, so there is a funding pot uh, that can help you, um, that you can apply to, so that you can actually uh, use that funding to, to utilize these trainings for your teams. And then Groundswell also has some fantastic toolkits there. So this on this link, you can go and find uh, toolkits around um, warnings and sanctions, are psychologically informed. There's one about reducing evictions and services. So this is another really good resource that you can use. And then lastly, some reading if you're really interested in this. Um, Emma Williamson was one of the original psychologists who started Pi and Hostel about a decade ago. And the Lambeth Project was one of the original pilot hostels. And this video is a similar brief of today, but they went into a lot of technical detail about outcomes, about um, the, some really specific models. So if you want a much more technical overview uh, of Pi, I, I recommend that, that video. And um, 
Emma is, you know, this is one of the, the people in the country who's doing a lot to, to propagate high at systemic levels, talking to the governments about getting this rolled out uh, across, across the whole country. And then there's some really good books here. And first and foremost, I'd recommend that first one there, Social Exclusion, Compound Trauma and Recovery. If you're working in a homelessness service and you want to understand complex trauma and PI, this, I think, is a great Bible to have. I think every service should have that. And here's my contact details once again. If you want to get in touch with me about training or the pizzazz or anything you want to know more, you can email me. That's my direct email. The training email also comes to me because I'm head of training for BGPS at the moment. So either will get to me. Um, and our training brochure, which has full details of all of our training offers, you can access that through our website, uh, which is bgsite.com. So we've got 10 minutes for some Q&As. So I'm going to open up the Q&A box. And I'll just have a quick look at the chat box as well, just to see if there was any extra questions in there so in the chat box if you haven't opened that up uh we put some details in there of the frontline training network fund uh you can click on the, the link there monthly newsletter um so do have a look at the chat box so questions in the q a so there's one here again about the uh, another pie dichotomy about finding a balance here so how can you focus on informal engagement without encroaching on professional boundaries so again it's about having these conversations with your team is about thinking together around um you know what are the barriers to informally engaging with our clients um can we actually add it into um the tasks that that we are um needing to get through to their team can we wrote to somebody and this has been done in services not my one but one of our sister services the manager used to wrote to somebody for an hour just to go and sit in the communal area and read a book or watch television. And you might be thinking well, that's a terrible waste of time, but it isn't because it creates that space of opportunity. So all of a sudden clients who are struggling to come to keep to key work sessions because that formal engagement is very threatening, scary, overwhelming. Actually, maybe somebody just wants to come and sit over there while I'm reading my book and they're gonna read their book. And maybe the following week they might have a little chat. And maybe the following week I might say, hey, do you fancy playing a bit of Scrabble? And then a couple of months down the line, come to a key work session, let's go to a coffee, look for a coffee, let's look at some education and employment, for example. So it's building up that informal engagement. So you can still be really professionally boundaries and do that in a, in a more structured way in your team. Um, and then stating the obvious, informal engagement needs to stay within the confines of your work. So you're not meeting up with clients outside of work. You're not sharing personal information or social media with clients. Like these are, those are non-negotiable boundaries. So you're informally engaging in the context of your job role, but you're, you're making sure that it's prioritized somehow. Uh, another question, how regular do you think reflective practice should be? Um, the service is having it quarterly. I think, I, I mean, in an ideal world where we have unlimited funding, um, quarterly maybe isn't as often as we'd want it to be. As I said, I think the industry standard is monthly. So I deliver reflective practice to lots of teams and they're, they're monthly reflective practice sessions. As I said, when I was in house, we did it fortnightly. So, you know, if you could have it fortnightly or more, if you if you've got access to that, that's fantastic. Um, but the reality of the, the system is that actually this costs money. Um, and if your organization can afford it quarterly, then that's better than nothing. So it's about making the most of it. We also have a, a training about making the most of effective practice. So just how are we utilizing that time? Um, and if that's if that is the best your organize, organization can afford, then you know, at least you've got that because many services actually still don't have it at all. Uh, but yeah, probably monthly would be the average. Um, someone's asked for a link to a staying well plan. So that's a really good question, actually, because I don't have, I haven't found a template for it. So if, if anyone's got a really good template, um, then I don't know if there's a way of sharing that um, 
in the chat or afterwards that can be sent around to people, I tend to encourage services to create their own. So covering those areas. So with any of this stuff, whether you're trying to share um, emotion regulation techniques with people, whether you're doing a staying well plan, the more creative and personalized you can be with it, the better. Um, so with a staying well plan, it might be having having your service actually create a template um, and the memories might you know you might put photos there might be pictures there might be spaces for you know graphics as well as just sort of some positive things we've achieved together to write out and then you might have a page of troubleshooting which is going to be very dependent on the client um, but the common ones would be fear loneliness um, you know needing support but not having it in-house because I'm living independently where do I go for it having a final page of people you can contact once you've moved on um so th that's probably not the most helpful answer but there there are probably already some good templates in the form of uh, relapse prevention booklets um so you can google those but my my actual answer would be make your own because then you can make it really personalized um top tips on explaining getting buy-in from staff on psychologically informed practice that's a really good question because it's hard to do. And that kind of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. It takes a lot of time because what you're going for here, if, if you've got a team that isn't used to this way of working, what you're trying to do is create a whole culture shift. So what you will find is that you're going to have some people who, who love it immediately and just get it and want to do it. And you'll have other people who just don't believe in it or are worried about it or scared of it. Um, and you need to just work over time to get the people who are on board with it to encourage everyone else, actually sort of start to get some of these things into the uh, daily running of the service, so regular effects practice, regular um, positive activities, etc. And over time, hopefully, what you'll see is that the resistance staff, sorry, that, that's not a very nice word to use, but staff who aren't really bought into it um, will say, will suddenly see that actually it's working. They'll see the gains. Uh, and that certainly happened where I was. We had uh, a few staff who just, just didn't buy it. And by the time I left, they were going, you know what? I thought you were talking a load of rubbish when I first met you, but I get it now. I see it. Um, so it's kind of, you, you win them over by doing it, I would say. Um, Another sort of another question there about the staying well plan. Did, I think it, did I say relapse prevention booklet? It's a, I think it's often used in substance use services and mental health services. You have relapse prevention plans for clients, um, and there's lots of different uh, templates. But again, um, I, I I believe you might get the slides, or this is at least recorded. So um, if you go back to that slide around the areas that you want to hit, you can just make your own template. Uh, we've got two more minutes. One more question here about a scenario highlighting how Pi could be or has been embedded and what that would look like without Pi. So if I'm understanding the, the question correctly, I think uh, actually the case study that I used earlier is, is a real life example of how Pi was embedded. So over time with staff kind of gradually, and it, it wasn't easy, I, I you know, it's, in these types of presentations, it makes it sound really simple, but you know, there were so many days where we felt like we were sort of treading water or going backwards or hitting barriers or COVID especially kept throwing on lots of barriers. And you're thinking, is it working? Are we actually making any difference here? But you just have to keep persisting. And the difference sort of before and after was really encompassed there in the um in my trainee's dissertation and in, in, in the answers. So where, you know really great client engagement compared to a service where you know maybe some clients are flying under the radar and, and not getting that same engagement other clients are just kind of haven't been to the key work for two years uh, people are abandoning more getting evicted more so all of the the aims really of pi you would say that if you if you hadn't embedded pi into the service you'd be having um kind of less of those positive outcomes. So hopefully that answers that question. I, I think the case study I gave is the best answer I can give to that question. 
Okay, so I think we're at half past or 29 past, and I think that's all the questions. So um, hopefully this was interesting. The problem with the webinar is that I can't see you, but um, hopefully everyone has taken away something from today. And as I said, do get in touch with me if you want to know more uh, or if you want to get any more training on any of these topics. And enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.